My name is Elena Campbell. I'm president of the Rochester Regional Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Legislative Affairs Committee Candidates Forum with the two candidates running for our 45th district in the State House of Representatives, Mark Tisdale and Barb Aness. A uh, few housekeeping things before we get started. We are recording this call and we will make it available on our YouTube channel for those who weren't able to participate uh, in person today. Well, I guess I shouldn't say in person, virtually today. <laughs> um, please remain on mute uh, throughout the call. We ask that you if you have questions, you please type them in the chat box and myself as the moderator will ask the questions. We wanna make sure that uh, lots of people have an opportunity to ask questions. However, we wanna review them to make sure we're not asking the same question over and over again. So we can kind of condense some of the things uh, that have a similar topic. Um, we would also ask that you keep it business related as well. Um, the chamber does represent obviously businesses here in our community. Uh, and because of our limited time, we'd like to focus on uh, those issues related to um, businesses. So with that, it's my great pleasure at this point to introduce the chairman of our board of directors, John Young, Vice President of Marketing and Communications at Oakland University to say a few words. Thanks, Elena. Um, well, welcome on behalf of the board and the uh, Legislative Affairs Committee. Thanks everybody for joining us today. I wanna to thank the candidates for carving out time. We appreciate uh, given the busy campaign schedules that you made time for us. Also wanna thank Elena, Maggie and Carol for everything you guys have been doing to keep things going and moving forward. Um, and also uh, special thanks to our foundation board members who are able to join us. You guys have uh, also been wonderful during these um, most interesting times. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Elena and um, again to the candidates, we appreciate your time being with us. Thank you, John. And thank you for your leadership during this uh, interesting year. We've joked about it often, uh, John, had no idea what he was in for <laughs> when he agreed to be chair of our board of directors for 2020. So he has handled the roller coaster ride extremely well and has truly been a leader for our organization. And we appreciate all of your time, especially given everything that we know you also have going on in your work life and your home life, you know, as well. So we appreciate you very much. Thank you. I'd I'd like to thank also Linda Davis Kirksey is on the call with us. Linda, if you could give a little wave. Linda serves as vice chair of the Chambers Foundation, and she has been an absolute rock star this year as well, uh, helping us to navigate everything that's going on. Uh, was also, I'll point out, very helpful uh, in uh, getting us a um, uh, writing a grant. Uh, to Consumers Energy. So our foundation did just receive a grant from Consumers Energy to assist our businesses with technology, uh, digital uh, online platforms, e-commerce. So you're gonna see some more of that roll out uh, as soon as we receive those funds and put our final plan together. So thank you so much to Linda for our, her expertise in assisting us with that. We appreciate it. So I'm going to make a couple of announcements before we get started, and I've, I think everybody can see my screen. Uh, we do have another candidates forum coming up this Friday for the County Commission District 11. Currently that seat is held by Tom Kuhn. He is running for re-election and he's being challenged by Tim Burns. So as you all know, uh, with Michigan's Supreme Court decision that was handed down last Friday, um, a lot of the rules and regulations are shifting. Um, some of that is shifting to the county level. So it's more important than ever that we understand who's running for these seats uh, and what their views are and that we're informed voters at the county level. Sometimes our county commission, I think, gets a little bit overlooked or overshadowed uh, in the election process, but I think more than ever, 
right now, it's really important to understand um, who you want to represent you on the county commission. So this Friday at 9 a.m., we will do the same thing, a candidates forum with Tom Kuhn and Tim Burns. We are also working on one for next Wednesday, the 14th at 9 a.m. We are still waiting on confirmation from one candidate uh, but that would be for the 15th district of the county commission and that seat is currently held by adam kokendurfer who's running for re-election and he's being challenged by melanie hartman so as soon as we have confirmation on that we will get information out to everyone so another important um, candidates forum to participate in i also wanted to um point out a couple of upcoming new things that we've got on our calendar. One is a webinar with Aaron Bemis, a trainer with Grow With Google, how YouTube can help you grow your business. I just talked about the importance of having that online presence. We all saw things, uh, we knew they were shifting already and already had shifted online, but it really came to the forefront uh, when a pandemic hit the importance of having that online presence. So uh, we've put together this webinar with Aaron Bemis to talk about how you can grow your business using YouTube. Um, and speaking of YouTube, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the Chambers YouTube channel. Uh, Michelle Everly, our digital marketing specialist, is doing an absolutely phenomenal job of putting everything on our YouTube channel, all these recorded webinars, all of our calls that we're doing weekly, our update calls um, are available on there. So please take a look at that and subscribe so that you'll get notified whenever we upload new content. We also have set up, and I'm very excited about this, a Q&A session with the uh, SBA Region 5 Administrator, Rob Scott. Uh, he is the administrator over five states for the U.S. Small Business Association or Administration. Uh, we had an opportunity to host him uh, and Congresswoman Slotkin for a roundtable uh, about maybe a month ago now. Um, and had the opportunity to spend half a day with him, uh, which was absolutely phenomenal. He has agreed to participate in a Q&A session uh, with all of our chambers actually in Oakland County. We set this up and made it available to all of the chambers uh, in Oakland County. So um, you'll get to hear directly from him. He was very, very involved in um, very quickly putting together the system uh, that allowed us uh, to apply uh, for the PPP and the idle loans, which was no small feat, as you can imagine. Um, and then last but not least, I have to uh, encourage you to please uh, register for our Sunrise Pinnacle Awards uh, ceremony. As you know, we had to pivot this to an online uh, event this year. We hired a professional video uh, production company who is producing this event for us. They have been filming uh, furiously for the last three weeks. Uh, all of the award winners uh, and all of our award sponsors and are putting together an absolutely amazing program. It will premiere on uh, November 2nd uh, at 9 a.m. And you can see we have our countdown clock up here. 26 days, 49 minutes and 22 seconds. Seconds. It's sponsored by PNC Bank. We are so appreciative of their sponsorship. I can't even tell you how much it means uh, that they uh, are continuing to sponsor this program and understood how that it was more important than ever this year that we recognize our heroes. Uh, we have all seen it uh, throughout our community, the individuals, the businesses, and the nonprofit organizations that very quickly stepped up to the plate uh, to help in so many different ways. So it was more important than ever that we had our Sunrise Pinnacle Awards this year um, and were able to recognize uh, those individuals. So make sure you register for that. There's two options, $15 gets you the link uh, to the event. So please understand, even though we're doing it virtually, it's still costing us a lot of money uh, to put this program together. Um, so $15 gets you the link. And then for $35, you can have the VIP experience uh, and uh, 
have a, a beautiful swag bag uh, uh, that you can pick up at the chamber office filled with all kinds of amazing goodies for you from uh, lots of our local businesses and sponsors. So we're really excited about that. So I am going to stop sharing my screen and I will let you know how this is going to work. So each candidate is going to have five minutes to introduce themselves and I will be timing it. Uh, we'll start with Barb uh, and then Mark. Please uh, type your questions in the chat box. You can begin typing them now and throughout their introductions. Uh, and then uh, after they each introduce themselves, uh, I will ask uh, questions. Each candidate will have two minutes uh, to answer the question and I will time that as well. We'll start with Barb uh, answering first and then Mark, and then we'll flip the next question. Mark will get to answer first, and then Barb will get to answer the question. Uh, then at 9.50, uh, each candidate will have three minutes for their final remarks. Uh, and we'll start with Barb on that and end with Mark. So that's how it's gonna work today. And um, I, now have the great pleasure of introducing our first candidate, which is Barb Aness. And I won't say a whole lot, Barb, because I know you will, but Barb is a chamber member and has been uh, for a while, uh, and as is Mark too. So it's kind of exciting to have two chamber members uh, running for the seat. Uh, we're proud of both of you for stepping up uh, to serve our community. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Barb. Thank you, Elena, and good morning to everyone, and thank you to the Regional Chamber for uh, hosting this candidate forum. My name is Barb Annas, and I'm the Democratic candidate for the seat for state representative here in the 45th District. Rochester Hills has proudly been my home for 24 years. Truth be told, I'm an Ohio native, so don't hold that against me. Um, but uh, my husband and I bought our first and only house here in Rochester Hills. Uh, I have built a small graphic design business. Uh, we've raised our two kids here, and I've worked to give back to my community through advocacy and dedicated public service. And it's said that when you vote in elections once a year, you, well, you only vote in elections once a year, but when you volunteer, you vote every day about the type of community that you want to live in. And um, my advocacy passion and my call to public service, wreck this philosophy, uh, for 17 years, I've served in various uh, leadership roles with Michigan PTA, um, including locally as president, vice president, and two years on the Michigan PTA's board of directors, as well as I still currently serve as their federal legislative chair. Uh, if you thought that PTA was just about fake sales and fun runs, uh, guess again, it's about true advocacy uh, because my role has taken me to the capitals in both Lansing and Washington, D.C. to advocate not only for children within the greater Rochester community, but all children throughout the state of Michigan as it relates to public education and helping them reach their full potential. As your current uh, elected trustee for the Rochester Community Schools Board of Education, I oversee, along with my six other board colleagues, a general fund budget of around $182 million annually, a student body of around 15,000 students, and uh, we are the largest employer in the greater Rochester area with approximately 1,500 employees. Um, being a small business owner and a member of the Rochester Regional Chamber myself, which Elena had mentioned, um, my role on the school board has really underscored for me how important quality schools are uh, to a thriving economy. And our local businesses are the lifeblood of our economy here in Greater Rochester, and that's why it's so important that we are preparing our students for the skills um, that they need uh, to be employable and that employers are looking for now and in the future. Um, but more than anything, I think we really need to talk about the big elephant in the room, which is, I know firsthand, the biggest issue on our minds today, and that is COVID-19 and this pandemic. As a small business owner, I understand that it's impacted our economy. Um, more specifically, uh, just I think two days ago, there was some uh, statistics that came out regarding our labor force 
person. Uh, it's, it's adversely impacting women who are working in the workforce. Around 100, 865,000 women have dropped out. That's four times higher than men in the workforce. So it's impacting families directly right now. As a school board member and a PTA leader, I understand how it's impacted our schools. And Elena mentioned there's lots of pivoting going on these days, and especially in the space of public education. As a mom, I know how it's affected our families, and because um, we have a 19-year-old now son who's back at home learning remotely. So we are facing unprecedented and uncertain times. And it's important to have a state representative who understands the challenges that folks in this community are facing and have a proven track record of working in a nonpartisan way to get results. I'll put my experience to work to make progress on the issues that will actually make a difference in families' lives. And it starts with ensuring that our families and small businesses have the supports that they need to weather this pandemic. Um, second, we need to invest in education by investing in our classrooms and work collaboratively with businesses to help identify the skills they need so we can put students on the right path, whatever that path is, be it a four-year degree, a technical, or a skilled trades path to acquire the jobs that are out there. Lastly, we need to ensure our infrastructure and our roads from bridges to water infrastructure and broadband are invested in because we need those things to survive for the future. So I haven't taken this step to run as state representative as a career move, but rather as, out of a sense of purpose and vision for what I know we can do better. So I'm running for this house seat to continue to champion what works for this community in Greater Rochester, and to also move the needle for the state of Michigan on funding and policies to help grow this state. So thanks so much for the opportunity to chat, and I look forward to questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Barb, I appreciate your introduction. And now we will go to Mark Tisdale. Mark also um, a member, member. And uh, take it away, Mark. Is my video coming through? It's not. Yeah. Any, I'm, I'm seeing myself here, but I'm getting some uh, text messages that I'm not showing, so I don't know. I don't know what to do here. In the lower, uh, where you see the little video camera in the yeah. left. Yeah, it says it's on. I'm seeing myself on my monitor, but I'm not, uh, I don't know. Anyway, well, I'll go ahead and start. Take it away. Go ahead and start this. Uh, thank you, Elena, John Young, and the Rochester Regional Chamber of Commerce for hosting this candidate forum. I guess to make it official, my name is Mark Tisdall, and I'm the Republican nominee for the 45th District State House of Representative seat covering Rochester, Rochester Hills, and a part of Oakland Township. My wife Susan and I moved to Rochester Hills with our two children back in 1989. We were looking for a community with a real downtown, and Rochester fit that bill perfectly. The paved trailway systems, in Rochester Hills, now 97 miles worth. The Paint Creek Trail, the schools, and the great housing values all sealed the deal. In 1999, I decided to become self-employed and joined a longtime friend in returning to the medical malpractice insurance industry. In 2000, I bought in as an agency partner. It wasn't until 2011 that I first ran for public office, the at-large city council seat, had been held by my friend Vern Pixley. My eight years on the Rochester Hill City Council, the last four as council pre president, proved to be a wonderful experience. Many residents are unaware that the Rochester Hill City government has 30 resident-driven boards, commissions, and committees with about 140 residents appointed to serve. Each city council member, in addition to their council duties, sits on a half dozen or so of these resident-driven committees serving side-by-side -side with their neighbors as they direct city policies. Over my eight years as an at-large city council member, I served on the Traffic and Safety Board, six years as the liaison to the Government Youth Council. I was on the Older Persons Commission Board of Trustees, the Retiree Health Care Trust, Cemetery Advisory and Trust Committees, Human Resources, Personnel Board, liquor licensing, pine trace, water and sewer, 
Rochester's sister city, the Strategic Planning and Policy Committee, and the Police and School Liaison Steering Committee, and the Public Safety and Infrastructure, Infrastructure Committee that dealt with law enforcement, fire, and EMS, and capital equipment, as well as local and major roads maintenance and reconstruction. Lastly, my 27 years ago, I volunteered as a cantor at St. Andrew Catholic Church. In 1994, I was asked if I would do a benefit concert for Angel's Place. I've done 25 annual benefit concerts for them now. Along the way, I've also raised money for the Rochester Area Neighborhood House, the Older Persons Commission, Dutton Farm, and many more great organizations. In short, no one in this community has a similar record of combined public and private sector experiences. The greater Rochester area has been very welcoming and supportive of me, my family, and my efforts. Representing the 45th District and the State House of Representatives will be a great way to continue a return on the investment that the voters, community leaders, and elected officials have made in me. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. And I think it's something with your camera because I'm showing your video is on as well. So I'm thinking your camera. Uh, is on. So just. Uh, I, I, so don't, I don't know. Um, okay. Now we're going to get to some questions and. Um, uh, like I said before, each candidate will have two minutes uh, to respond to the question. We'll start with Barb uh, on the first question uh, to answer first. And uh, what do you see as the biggest challenge for Michigan small businesses as we navigate through COVID-19? Nope. And hey, your button is on. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I know. Um, well, that's a great question because I, I believe first and foremost, the only way to get our economy back to pre-pandemic levels is to get control of this virus. Because if we don't get control of the virus and take the proper precautions such as mask wearing and social distancing, we can run the, the risk of going back to where we were back in March and April, which uh, would make all the current pandemic challenges even worse on our small businesses. Um, I do believe that the restrictions on capacity and mask wearing uh, that were mandated um, and had given the public the confidence that they needed to go out and eat and go shopping and, and go back out and do the things that everyone normally does um, and keep people safe while they're doing it. Um, and I'm a little concerned about the Supreme Court ruling, which invalidated that, but I was glad to see that the Oakland County uh, had stepped up to take the onus off of small businesses to require uh, masks still in public places. Um, but the best thing that we can do is look at the long game to help businesses stay afloat and not make the situation even more dire uh, than it is by fully reopening without following the, the advice of public health experts and CDC recommendations. Um, at a state level, we need relief for small businesses who've incurred expenses during this pandemic to ensure that they have the proper PPE and the supplies that they need to ensure a safe workplace. And businesses um, that have bills currently, you know, that they can meet those demands. Um, there's some things in the House right now that would offset uh, for small businesses paying taxes on the PPE that they purchased since the inception of the pandemic. And we need to recognize, though, that additional assistance must come from the federal level. So I would also support small or low no interest loans to cover the, the lost tax revenue new tax credits for businesses to help uh, cover employer obligations and working with the chamber here, uh, which is a great resource for uh, businesses to help uh, do that hard pivot that uh, businesses ha have had to <laughs> platforms and technologies for remote business practices. Okay, thank you so much, Barb. All right, Mark. So the question was, what do you see as the biggest challenge for Michigan small businesses? as we navigate through COVID-19. I apologize that I'm not getting my video and I, 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 I'm frustrated by that. But anyway, um, I think the biggest issue is getting authority 
pushed back down to the street level, um, allowing businesses, medical professionals, the Oakland County Health Department, uh, municipalities, local hospitals to all pitch in together and try and figure out what's the best way to manage this, this uh, COVID-19 virus. Uh, again, door to door, store to store, in the schools. Um, I think many businesses were frustrated that they never really got the opportunity to manage this virus from day one and instead were you know, f forced into uh, significant reductions in their revenues or even, even closing altogether. Uh, and coming back with limited capacity like restaurants, a restaurant for example needs 100% of its, of, its, of its kitchen staff to be in even though it can only serve 25% capacity or takeout only. Um, I'd like to see clearer, measurable, and more objective metrics for businesses, the schools and hospitals, medical professionals to look at from the state and county level on down, for example, a matrix of, you know, what's the rate of, of uh, uh, transmission um, on one axis and maybe the uh, positive testing rate on another axis and make that a matrix and come to what phases are we in or what's allowed, what's not allowed. Again, something that everyone can look at, understand, and, and, and run with uh, within a particular time period. Um, so those are, those are the first things. Get, it, get, it, get authority back to the people that are on the front lines and, 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 and where the rubber meets the road. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. All right. The next question, uh, Mark, you'll have the opportunity to answer this one first. Uh, and then Barb, how can we support our businesses to enforce mask policy now that the authority seems to be with the health department? So Mark, take it away. Well, again, I think the Open County uh, Health Department, many of the professional associations like the Chamber, uh, like the Michigan State Medical Society, for example, um, Michigan Dental Association, all of those third parties should come forward and, and provide direction and commentary. For me, um, you know, a mask is, is today, it's almost more good manners than anything else. You wanna, you wanna present yourself to society in a way that isn't threatening to others, isn't you know, causing concern for others. And it comes down to what's best for business, what's best for your organization, what's best for your store or restaurant, and people aren't gonna come in if they feel uncomfortable. So again, those third party advisory groups like the, the Regional uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, like the Michigan State Medical Society, taking direction from the different counties relative to what's going on in those counties for transmission rates and, and uh, uh, testing positive rates. Okay, thank you, Mark. All right, Barb. So, you know, I agree in that, uh, you know, Oakland County has stepped up and, uh, you know, helped local businesses by giving the guidance uh, that for mask mandates, but also taking the onus off of, uh, you know, businesses feeling like they have to make a choice between, uh, you know, a customer walking into their shop and not wearing a mask and becoming the police of that very issue. Um, but we also have to recognize that this still is a public health crisis. And uh, while these other entities can provide some guidance, uh, the guidance really should be coming from uh, organizations like our Oakland County Health Department, especially at a, at a county level, uh, to help businesses. Um, and I also agree with Mark in terms of uh, wearing a mask is uh, a courtesy. It's a health courtesy that I myself do for others that I'm around. And um, I think it's something that um, there's 
there's some confusion that's been caused um, for businesses, but I think there do there there has to be clear um, guidelines in terms of you know what businesses can do um, to protect themselves, their businesses, their livelihoods, and their employees, um, and make their customers feel comfortable too, um, so that they want to come into that that space of business and um, and do business. So, um, you know, I still think there needs to be um, additional guidance provided um, from a county level and even a state level because this is still a pandemic and it's still um, a health crisis. Okay, thank you. All right, our next question. Um, the mandate and closure of businesses for several months and the inability of many businesses to be at full capacity has greatly impacted our local economy and small business community. If elected, how would you work to ensure that we can get our local businesses back up and running at pre-pandemic levels? So the first person to answer this time is Barb. So, um, you know, at the end of this pandemic, unfortunately, it's estimated that one in six small businesses won't survive. Um, and I think that's a really bleak reality. Um, but we've really seen locally how our businesses have pivoted to uh, try and accommodate the uh, phasing in of uh, being able to accommodate businesses. Um, we need to make sure that we're able to give um, businesses the resources that they need to um, continue to grow or even start a business. Um, we need to make sure that we're investing, continuing to invest in education, high quality infrastructure so that people can get things to the market uh, to continue to do their business. But to reiterate, uh, we have to rebuild our health. Um, to tackle the economy, we need to solve the underlying problem of the spread of this pandemic and its impact on our public health. Um, so I want to, you know, work to make sure that we're following the CDC guidelines and the precautions and um, making sure that experts in science are consulted um, to make sure, you know, that those uh, issues are being addressed um, within our businesses. Um, and in terms of, you know, investing in other things that help our businesses, um, because I think we've all seen how inextricably, um, the success of people being able to stay home, to stay safe, if businesses are making their employees work remotely, um, it's causing a burden on families who have to also educate their children at home. So we have to make sure that, um, you know, as uh, public educators and public school districts are, are working in communities to phase back in schooling um, so that it's safe for children to go back and um, so that employees can go back and teach uh, children too, but also so that, um, you know, families can get back to a, a some semblance of normalcy and be able to do their jobs, even if it's still remotely. Um, because businesses are, you know, changing, having to change uh, the format in which um, they are allowing and having employees work. Um, so this okay. is really critical to our infrastructure or to the continuation of making okay. sure businesses right. succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. All right, uh, Mark, the question was, um, the mandated closure of businesses for several months and the inability of many businesses to still be at full capacity has greatly impacted our local economy and small business community. If elected, how would you work to ensure that we can get our local businesses back up and running at pre-pandemic levels? Well, that's going to be a huge challenge, to say the least. I think from Lansing, what, what we provide uh, through the resources available to the state is information, uh, guidelines, direction, but you need to provide the freedom and the flexibility uh, for local businesses to creatively try and manage, again, this, this virus, um, you know, at the, uh, at the street level door to door, store to store, and in, in the schools, hospitals, dental offices, uh, you name it. Um, the creative ideas and answers will not come out of Lansing. Uh, they likely will not come out of um, uh, Oakland County government. Um, again, guidelines, parameters, direction, information, um, Customers will decide 
just how open and successful the economy is as they feel safe in entering your business uh, in, in participating in, in, the, in the economy once again, as opposed to ordering online or, or uh, doing everything remotely. Customers will decide how successful that re-entry into the, into the economy and into the marketplace is. And, and that's where businesses have the opportunity to be creative, to present themselves as a, a safe and welcoming um, uh, enterprise for, for customers, patrons to, to come and enjoy the experience and to, to um, you know, build, build those retail revenues back up. Okay, thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. All right, so the next question, um, Barb, uh, no, Mark gets to answer first. Sorry, <laughs> then Barb. <laughs> um, so with the weather turning colder here in Michigan, outdoor seating for our restaurants will cease to be an option. At 50% capacity, many food establishments will not make it through the winter. What would you propose as a solution to help these important local businesses survive the winter months? So, Mark, you're first. Well, as I said earlier, when you're operating at a diminished capacity, particularly for a restaurant, you still have to have 100% of your, of your kitchen staff in. Um, many of the wait staff work primarily on tips so the reduction in their hourly wages for the restaurant owner does not necessarily significantly reduce their standard costs. Like I said before, it's information, direction, parameters, and allow, allow restaurants and businesses the ability to be creative, to find new ways to address this issue, to manage the problem on the ground, and make their customers feel co comfortable and welcomed in their, in, in their establishments. And uh, that, again, the customers will decide if it's, if it's time to get back out uh, in, in public or not. But many of these restaurants, I'm very good friends with a, a, a gentleman that owns a, a number of properties downtown Rochester. He has not been collecting rents, but they're, the, the, the restaurants still have to pay insurance, um, wages, uh, uh, taxes, you know, he, those things still need to be covered. So it, it's a very difficult situation that a lot of these businesses are going to find themselves in. Uh, but if we provide them with some information and direction and then get out of the way and let, and let them find what works best for their particular uh, uh, enterprise, I, th that's, that's, that's the best answer. All right, thank you, Mark. Right on cue. All right, Barb, uh, the question again was with the weather turning colder here in Michigan, outdoor seating for our restaurants will cease to be an option. At 50% capacity, many food establishments will not make it through the winter months. What would you propose as a solution to help these important local businesses survive the winter months? So what I've seen, um, and you know, I hate, I think um, the phrase or the the turn of phrase or the word that is going to be the word of 2020 is pivot. Um, we have seen our local restaurants in this community uh, do a really good job of pivoting. Um, even when we were uh, in the early times of this pandemic in the spring into early summer, staying home to stay safe, uh, they did a great job of re-looking uh, at their business model in terms of, you know, how can they still provide, um, you know, the services and, and be the restaurant that people want to choose even when they can't physically go into the space. Um, and so we've seen restaurants do that already. And um, actually, I think it was the uh, Park 600 and the Royal Park Hotel that did it, had a great 
um, you know, carry out, you know, order a pizza kit and, um, you know, have pizza at home. Um, so there's a lot of creat creativity that we're seeing from local businesses. Um, and I think we need to continue uh, to give them that license to be creative. Um, but at the same time, you know, we need to make sure that uh, the spaces that they have can stay safe so that if patrons do feel safe to go in, that they can choose to go in and um, eat meals within their establishments. But um, most certainly the restaurant industry within this community is probably one of the most hardest hit uh, small businesses around. Um, but it's been great to see how they have pivoted and I think they can continue to do so in order to meet their customer, de customer demands during this time. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so now the next question, the first person to answer is Barb and then Mark. And it is, how do you plan on keeping businesses accountable to abide by guidelines and parameters that make customers and employees safe? If customers can decide whether or not to enter a business based on their safety precautions, how can we guarantee the employees are also safe? So Barb, you're first. Great question. So I think uh, it really gets around to the supports that small businesses have in this community to do so. Um, you know, I, in talking with voters, I spoke with a small business owner in downtown Rochester that was uh, doing the pivot thing again. Uh, she was trying to arrange her shop so that she could accommodate six feet of spacing for customers when they come in. But she was also concerned about making sure that her employees had the PPE that they needed to be safe in order to do their jobs when they came in to work. Uh, so we have to make sure that, you know, and again, I mentioned this early at the top, but, you know, um, giving small businesses uh, the tax breaks that they need in order to cover the, the additional cost um, that is falling on them to buy that PPE to keep their employees safe and to make sure that they have spaces where customers feel safe too. Um, I think that it, it is really challenging um, to make sure that the guidelines are met by small businesses. But I also think I've seen a lot of small businesses um, being very accommodating um, in order to make customers feel safe. Hey, David Blair, Mike. Hey, hey Mark, sorry, I was just on the other. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, it's a win-win when employers um, have the tools that they need to keep their spaces safe and keep their employees safe. I think that's when you'll see biz customers want to come back and frequent those establishments. Great. Thank you. Okay, Mark, the question again was, how do you plan on keeping businesses accountable to abide by guidelines and parameters that make customers and employees safe? If customers can decide whether or not to enter a business based on their safety precautions, how can we guarantee the employees are also safe? That's good. Uh, Barb, I apologize for chiming in there. I'm trying to get a hold of my IT guy to see what's going on here, but Again, it's a it's a it's it's a terrifically frustrating uh, circumstance where um, the cost of P PPE simply adds to their standard cost. The other the other concerns and exposures um, and and potential liabilities for these uh, for these businesses uh, if they if if an employee or a guest gets uh, gets sick. Uh, uh, as a result of uh, working or visiting an establishment, um, and at at restricted capacity, so these are these are all these are all huge problems that um, you you can throw more dollars at them from the state. I don't know what kind of relief is going to be coming from the federal government. Um, I, I just I just simply keep coming back to it's the creativity of the of the local business owners and the opportunity to exercise that uh, uh, good friends with a, uh, a, a gentleman that owns a number of uh, uh, drive through coffee and donut places that have small um, dining areas and they've actually done pretty well. But again, the additional cost of P PPE 
the training, the ongoing monitoring of processes, the constant changing of gloves, and of course, uh, the prices of PPE, uh, uh, personal protective equipment is going up all the time. So their standard costs are going up. They can't pass that along to their customers. And if, if you cannot expand a drive-in or a takeout option, you're, you're, you're gonna be hurting. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Mark. I think we have, uh, we're gonna do one more question and then we'll give each candidate uh, three minutes to wrap up. So the last question, uh, do you anticipate taxes increasing next year with the many businesses that might fail in Michigan and a shortage of state revenue? So Mark, you have the first opportunity to answer that question. I think it would be a tremendously bad idea to try and raise taxes while people are attempting to recover uh, from the COVID shutdown months, uh, from their inability to generate revenues. You know, there were 1.5, 1.6 million people that were told their jobs were non-essential. Um, and of course, that's gonna leave the psychological mark on those people for some time. Uh, one of my biggest concerns is that there's going to be a, a want or a push to increase business taxes. And I would just remind everyone, you know, businesses don't pay taxes. They only collect them. There's only three ways to get the money. There's only three pots of money. They can pass it along to the customers. They can get it from their employees in the form of uh, wage increases and benefit increases that are not given or, or reduced hours, or it's a hit to the stakeholders, dividends, capital gains, profits to the stakeholders. There's no other place for business taxes to come from. So when you hear that, just be aware that, you know, again, businesses don't pay taxes, they only collect them. Um, I personally like to see a revisit of the 2007 temporary increase in income taxes from 3.9 to 4.35 looked at again. Um, so in a time of recovery, increasing taxes is, is certainly not the answer. Okay, thank you, Mark. All right, Barb, the question again was, do you anticipate taxes increasing next year with the many businesses that might fail in Michigan and a shortage of state revenue? So, you know, when COVID hit our state, um, it was estimated that, uh, and this was back in the spring, that we would have almost a $3.2 billion shortfall. Um, the updated estimate now is a little less than a billion dollar shortfall, um, and this is due to federal stimulus and the PPP and the enhanced employment benefits uh, for businesses and the stimulus checks that um, families have received. So I think the last thing that we want to do is raise taxes, but we have to recognize that in order for us over the next year or two uh, to weather uh, this pandemic and its uh, recovery or us getting over it and its subsequent recover recovery, um, that we will need to work with our federal partners to have additional federal dollars to avoid uh, cutting essential services. Um, and so I, I think, uh, you know, re-looking at the effectiveness of how we structure Proposal A in terms of, um, you know, funding public education, uh, because they're going to be hit over the next couple of years, and how that impacts businesses, um, it's going to be serious. And, um, you know, I, I would hate to see um, that fall on the shoulders of businesses, but we also have to recognize that um, there is a federal component to us being to, to being able to survive and weather this. And as a state, uh, we should be demanding back some of those federal tax dollars uh, to our state to help us weather this storm. Awesome, thank you, Barb. All right, and you, you can see there are a few more questions in the chat box that we didn't get to. Um, I'm gonna read them off just not for an answer, but so that others can see what were some of the other questions on people's minds. Um, how can we support families and women who've had to leave the workforce to care for children? Um, uh, 
why is the superintendent holding our children back and getting an education full time when other districts and private schools are back full time? Um, are the attendees here today citizens of the state of Michigan or subjects of Governor Whitmer? Um, why is it okay for other districts to go back in person learning and not Rochester schools? So a few other questions that we couldn't get to. I did want to stay very focused on business related questions as I stated in the beginning, um, but that just lets you know kind of some of the other things that are on people's minds um, as far as um, the, what their concerns are. So with that, we're going to wrap up. And Barb, you're going to have three minutes uh, to do your final wrap up first. So take it away, Barb. Sure, thank you. Thanks again to the Chamber for hosting this. I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Our country and our world are currently in uncharted territories as we've been discussing. Um, a pandemic has upended our lives and ravaged our economy. And um, currently climate change is impacting millions of Americans in ways that we've seen never seen before. Uh, and millions are speaking out for more just and, equ and an equitable society. I know that times are tough because I've been hearing about these painful realities of this pandemic as I make, as I make phone calls to voters. But I'm also seeing how we can channel this into a uh, common purpose. Um, there was a voter I recently spoke with who uh, had been laid off in March uh, when COVID-19 hit, um, was struggling to receive unemployment benefits. Um, but now he's preparing uh, to do a business startup and a launch in November, and he's looking to hire employees. Um, and he was struggling to find those employees that uh, could be qualified to do the task at hand that he was looking for. Um, so I was able to follow up and connect him with some folks at Michigan Works so he can find the right workforce and launch in a timely manner. Um, as a candidate, I'm already helping future constituents in that capacity. So um, part of service and, is advocacy and being a resource. Um, so even during challenging times, I believe that we can find purpose and we can work together to invest in quality education, ensure access to health care, combat climate change, and ensure that the legislature prioritizes the needs of families and small businesses with equal opportunity for everyone. We need to collaborate um, and be collaborative, I mean, and um, experienced and compassionate leadership in the State House is exactly uh, the type of leadership that we need right now. And coming from this community um, and doing that for nearly two decades, um, I feel that I can uh, earn that spot and do that job well. So I hope I've earned your vote and your trust to be your next state representative for Greater, Greater Rochester. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. Okay, Mark. You have three minutes for your wrap-up. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Elena. Again, I apologize for the, uh, for the technical glitch here. Um, just a quick follow-up on, uh, on, the, on the last question and, and additional federal aid. You know, in April, we increased 231 years of federal debt uh, in, in one day in one vote. So we can't, we can't just keep printing money out of the out of the federal government. That will have a consequence. And as I said in my opening remarks, no one in this community has a similar record of combined public and private sector experiences from raising money for many great organizations, enjoying the successes and enduring the struggles of owning a small business, from holding citywide elective office, being unanimously appointed by my peers four consecutive times as council president to serving side by side with scores of fellow residents on committees as diverse as the Youth Council and Older Persons Commission, liquor licensing to traffic and safety, strategic planning to public safety and infrastructure. Finally, my church music ministry and years of benefit concert performances have been a huge part of my life. I can't describe what it feels like to help people as they worship, celebrate, and even mourn the loss of loved ones. It will be my great honor to represent the Rochester area in Lansing. I'm asking for your vote on November 3rd, or sooner, as you're staring at your absentee ballot, <laughs> and for your continued support of my service to this great community. May God bless Rochester, Rochester Hills, Oakland Township, 
and our Great Lakes state. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I do want to remind you or let you know uh, that the Rochester Regional Chamber of Commerce does not endorse candidates for political office. So we see our job as connecting you uh, with the candidates and providing opportunities for you to have a voice uh, directly uh, with them. So I just wanted to remind everybody of that. Um, thank you uh, both uh, Barb and Mark for joining us today. Like I said at the beginning, you know, we're so proud of you that you're both chamber members, that you're both putting your name out there and your um, your commitment to our community um, to possibly go and represent us in Lansing. Um, it truly is uh, a difficult job. <laughs> we all know that and this in particular year is um, very difficult. A lot of hard decisions um, have had to be made and will continue to have to be make, made. And we really appreciate your willingness to step up, uh, both of you, and represent us uh, in Lansing in making those hard decisions. Look for this recorded uh, video on YouTube later in the week um, and uh, feel free to share it with your friends who weren't able to participate today. So with that, thank you so much everyone for joining us. It's sunny out. I'm watching the sun over here through the window. It's, I love it. It's going to be a beautiful day. So go out and enjoy it. Thank you again. Thank you, Elena.